All right, turn to Luke chapter 11. I'm going to jump right in there because I'm excited. Today is going to be what I would call a meat and potatoes kind of message. I don't have a lot of illustrations, but it is a lot of really, really good content that is portable and applicable in your life. And so uh, you will, I guarantee, come away with something. There's a little bit for everybody in my message today. So um, Luke chapter 11, as I said earlier, you can search up the Bible app and uh, search Crossroads Church under the events tab, and uh, you will have all of my notes. And if you take notes, then um, I will just be that much more anointed and powerful as a speaker. When I was a youth pastor, I used to tell kids, if you uh, take notes in, in church or and church and youth, um, then God will you know, let you marry the person of your dreams. And it worked quite well. I had a lot of note takers. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, anyway... Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, says this, It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you that it changes us from the inside out. And I pray that we would open our minds and open our hearts to be changed by your word. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now this contains the Lord's Prayer. And I know most of you have heard the Lord's Prayer or have been given some sort of throw pillow, or framed artwork with some big doe-eyed little, you know, little kid with a little shepherd staff or something, and it contains the Lord's Prayer. No matter how often or how long you have attended a church, chances are you have heard this at one point in your life. Now, I think this is one of those passages And a prayer that the more we hear it, the more we take it for granted. I want to talk to you about this prayer and I want to break it down to you. We are in the second week of a series called Teach Us to Pray. And the disciples in this passage, they come with a request to Jesus. He says, they say, teach us to pray. And Jesus is taking them on a journey To show them and explain to them and to model for them what it means to live a life of prayer. I got thinking about this. Listen, if you are following God, the whole concept is you're supposed to be headed somewhere. Your life is not meant to be stagnant. Some of you guys in this place, you are doing the same thing that you have done for the last 20 years. Every Friday is pork chop night. Thursday's taco night. I wore this, I wore that. I have the same pair of Wranglers that I've had for the last 20 years. Now, nothing wrong with being frugal and and holding on to clothing. But, if you find that your life is stagnant, you are not living the life that God has called you to. Because God has not called you to a destination but a journey that ends in a destination. Faith is all about where he's taking you. And so we are constantly growing. We are constantly learning. We are constantly trying new things and expanding what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I encourage you first and foremost, if you're going to live for him, then go somewhere. Head somewhere in your life. Last week we talked about prayer being a lifestyle. It's more than just words that we say. It's more than just an activity. It's more than just an action. It is the shape of our lives. As we fill our lives with prayer, so takes the shape of our life. So this week, I'm jumping right into this. Um, I have been, uh, been working out much more than I normally do. It's good. 
But if you have ever worked out on a consistent basis or ran several years ago, I got into a thing where I was running constantly. If that's you or if you play any kind of a sport, you have heard of the term of a power song. Anybody ever heard of a power song? This is the song that if you need to crank it up a notch, if you find yourself stuck or hitting the wall, or if you feel like you're just about to quit, and you're on the treadmill, or you're running, and you're doing the, the I call it the bobblehead jog, where you, you're, just, you're just trying to get going, you know? You're just trying to put one foot in front of the other, and you need to go there. You need to power through. Everybody has a power song. And that is the song. You put on that song, and you find yourself a little more energized. You find yourself a little more focused. You find yourself breaking through that barrier. Now, whether that is 90s, you know, grunge rock, whether that's country, whether that is Aaron Neville, a pop ballad, whether that's Dan and Shay, whoever that is, you have that song that you go to. It could be the Barney theme, as far as we know. It doesn't matter. But whatever it is, it takes you to that place. And you find yourself powering through. It's a power song. Today, this prayer that Jesus gives as a blueprint is a It's that thing that can help you break through in a barrier in your prayer life. Has anybody ever felt stuck in your prayer life? Well, let's be let's be honest. This is a safe safe zone, safe place. I've gone through seasons in my life to where it has felt like every prayer that I utter just hits the ceiling and comes back and smacks me back in the face. Listen, if you have ever thought to yourself, "What's the point of prayer?" this message is for you. If you have ever felt yourself being weighed down or just, just being fatigued and tired in your prayer life, if you have ever felt yourself stuck in your prayer life, then this message is for you this morning. Because we are going to dive into the specific phrases that Jesus gives the disciples And they are actually, it's not an incantation. It's not something that you have to recite. And if I, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. It is not, it's not a script to be recited verbatim. But it is a blueprint, and it is filled with what I call power statements or power phrases. And if you can unlock these power phrases in your life and truly understand what they mean, then it will take your prayer life to a whole other level. You will, it will take you there. It will help you bust through barriers. It will help you get the, um, the stamina. It will help you get the energy that you need in hard times. It will take your prayer life to a whole other level today. Are you ready to go to a whole other level? In fact, I'm going to challenge you today. There are six phrases Six phrases given here. Now, you can start each day with this prayer and utilize all six phrases. Or, I challenge you to take one phrase and make that your prayer focus for one day a week. And then take the next phrase and make that your prayer focus for the next day and the next day. And it it can become a kind of a routine and it will help you take your prayer life to a whole other level. Let's break down these these, um, passages right now, or these phrases right now. The first one is, Father, hallowed be be your name. The next one, your kingdom come. The third one, give us each day our daily bread. Fourth one, forgive us our sins. The fifth one, as we forgive those indebted to us. And then the sixth one, lead us not into temptation. 
Now, if you put these all together, that gives us the entirety of the Lord's Prayer, the whole of the Lord's Prayer. But on their own, they become separate declarations, and they are extremely effective. When you boil them down to what they truly are, the essence, what these phrases are saying, and we apply them to our lives, and we align our hearts and our lives to the truth of these statements, it will become truly powerful. Let me give you an example. First phrase, Father, hallowed be thy name. Now, first of all, when was the last time you used the word hallowed in any conversation? I can't think of any. You know, I mean, you get down with Charleston's, how were those uh, mushrooms? Oh, they were hallowed. (laughs) Hallowed. Father, hallowed be thy name. If you break it down to to the essence of what it is, that power phrase becomes this. You are worthy of my praise. What Father Hallowed Be Your Name is, is simply this. You are worthy of my praise. Now that first word can revolutionize somebody's prayer life in here. Father. That word in itself can revolutionize your prayer life if you truly understand because the importance of what you speak is set up by the framework of who you are speaking to. Now, if I'm talking to my dog, for say, for example, I'm going to talk to my dog a certain way. It's my dog, right? Now, If I end up speaking to the Prime Minister of Great Britain or the President of the United States or another dignitary, I'm not going to speak to them as I speak to my dog. You you all getting with me? You know. I'm not going to go up to President Trump and go, who's a good boy? Are you a good boy? He's a good boy. (laughs) Which, first of all, that would be hilarious. If I ever do that, somebody videotape that because I'm going to want to see that from prison. So... (laughs) But what you say is set up by the framework of who you're speaking to. When you and I pray, we need to understand and get in alignment with who exactly we are speaking to. We are speaking to the living, the loving God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. My father used to make this kind of illustration as a joke as a kid. He said, we serve the God who sneezed stars. But we serve the God who created everything you and I see by the sheer power of his voice. But yet the word of God describes him as what? Our father. He is good and he is close to us. He is not a God who is far away. He is the intimate and loving God. He's not uncaring. He's a caring and loving father who hears us. And it says, you are worthy of my praise. His being worthy of our praise occurs in a vacuum. And what that means is that our circumstances do not direct and his being worthy is not dependent on our circumstances. He's worthy of our praise no matter what's happening in our lives. And when we pray that, when we get that, when we understand that, that no matter what's going on, I, you know, my day could be absolute junk right now. But you know what? God is still, you are still worthy of my praise. Amen. His prayer begins with praise. Your prayers, our prayers should always begin with praise. In fact, your day should always begin with praise. Now think of this, prayer is a conversation between you and God, and our prayer should always start with praise. What if you applied this to every conversation that you ever had? I'm going to start a conversation with something praiseworthy. I'm going to start every conversation with something positive. How do you think that's going to change your relationships and your conversations? Because some of us, let's be honest, we can't wait to start, we're going to lead with the negative. Did you hear what I heard? 
Check this out. Oh, somebody said this to me. Ooh, ooh. Right? But what if we started with something positive? Now listen, I mean really positive. Not the southern positive, which is, Lord, bless their heart. <laughs> right? Because listen, if you're in the south and someone says, bless your heart, what they're about to say is not positive. <laughs> Just know that. But everything starts with praise. You are worthy of my praise. This declares his closeness and his nature. He's a good God who is close to us. How good is he? How wonderful is he? When I always begin with praise, I will always end with gratitude. When I begin with praise, I will always end with gratitude. If you want to be happier in your life, if you want to be more thankful and have more gratitude, begin with praise. Second thing. Second statement is your kingdom come. And when you break that down, when you boil it down to its essence, what that means is I want what you want. This is a powerful statement in our prayers. You are worthy of my praise, and I want what you want. His kingdom comes. In fact, the book of Matthew says, your kingdom come and your will be done. Listen, life is not always, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with, with a little bit of truth here, okay? Watch out. Life is not always about getting your way. Faith is not always about getting your way. The God that you and I serve is not a holy Santa Claus. Here to fulfill the will and the whim of whatever you happen to want at the moment. But when I declare this in my life, I'm, I'm freeing myself from having to have everything my way. When I speak this in my life and I unlock this statement in my life through my prayer, I want what you want, then I free myself from the burden of having to get everything my way all the time. And even more so, I free everybody around me from the burden of me having to have everything my way all the time. I have a three and a half year old who has to have everything her way all the time. And I will tell you, it's exhausting. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's difficult. It's a hard standard to constantly live under having to have things our way all the time. But when we unleash this in our lives, we find that freedom. In fact, I know some of you are about to elbow your neighbor right now and say, stop trying to have it your way, right? See some elbows flying. Husbands, don't elbow your wife, trust me. Just, just <laughs> let it pass. <laughs> this statement also provides the greatest of strength in the hardest of circumstances. Even though I can't see it right now, I know his will is working out in the most difficult of my circumstances. I know that his will is happening. It may not even feel like it involves me at this moment, but I know his will is good. And I know that he is in control. He's worthy of my praise regardless of my circumstances because I know he's working through my circumstances. So when we put this into action... When I want what he wants, then my wants become worthwhile. Amen. When I want what he wants, then my wants become worthwhile. Amen. See, when we pray this, we begin to align ourselves. Our wants start to go beyond ourselves. They start to go, they become broader and they become wider and they start affecting more people because we start seeing people how he sees people. We start loving people how he loves people. We start caring for people as he cares for people. Amen. 
When was the last time somebody has hurt you and you prayed God's will for their life? And I'm not talking, God, I, you know, your will is to drop a piano on that person. No, like his legitimate will and blessings on their life. But when we unleash this statement in our prayers, I want what you want. And let's be honest, sometimes it's God help me to want what you want. Then we get in alignment with his heart. And we find that the things that we used to want start to go by the wayside. And the new things that we start to want become more worthwhile. Imagine your life when you reset your day, each day, and align your will with his will. Imagine when you wake up every morning and say, God, I want what you want today. I want what you want today. The third thing. Well, I love this real quick, because when that happens, if our day goes bad, it's okay, because it's not our day. It's his day. Which leads me to my third one. It says, give us each day our daily bread. And when you boil this down and get it down to the essence, this is what it means. I trust you to provide what I need. See, when we trust that his will is taking place, then we can trust the provision that he gives us. Romans 8, 28 says this, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. See, when I trust his kingdom to come, I trust what he brings on a daily basis. See, even bad things can produce a good work. So often we pray, And we say, God, I trust you. But in our minds, we think, I trust you as long as you give the answer that I'm looking for. But truth be told, then our trust is not really in God, but in the answer. And so then when he gives an answer that we don't want or we don't expect, then what do we do? We question two things. We either question God's goodness or his capability. Either God is not strong enough to give me the answer that I want, or he is strong enough and doesn't care. But when we trust him to give our daily bread, we can trust that what he brings us, it's being brought to us for our good. See, notice this. Notice this, and and trust me, as you can tell, I'm a person, I'm a foodie. I love food. So I notice these things. It does not say, Jesus doesn't say, Give us the day our daily chocolate cake. (laughs) Give us the day our daily ice cream, but daily bread. You see, chocolate cake is good, but it is not necessary for growing us stronger, although I wish it were. (laughs) I'm waiting for the people who invented the keto keto diet to be like, nah, keto, no way, chocolate cake diet. (laughs) You show me that diet. And we we got a deal. Things like that, as good as they are, they don't help you to grow strong. So Jesus is very intentional in his verbiage here. He says, give us our day, our daily bread. And what that means is give us today what we need to become stronger. Now, how powerful is that prayer in your life? God, I pray that today you would bring me what I need to make me stronger. And what he brings you may not be pleasant. What he brings you may challenge you. What he brings you may break you down a little bit. But what he brings you is brought to you so that you could become stronger. Give us our day and our daily bread. Putting this into action. When I trust his provision, I become grateful for what he provides. Every day, praying, God, I trust you to provide what I need. And in turn, I trust that everything you bring me is what I need. Power statement number four, forgive our sins. 
And what this means, when you boil this down, it means, I need your grace. Dear God, I need your grace. Listen, we should never, ever take grace for granted. We should never take grace for granted. Sometimes I feel for people who have served God for a long time, the grace of God becomes like when you're a teenager and your mom says that you're handsome. Have you ever been in that situation where your mom's like, or your dad or whoever it is, like, you're just, you're good looking, you're handsome. You're like, there's like a law somewhere that says you have to say that, right? You don't mean it, why? Because you're my mom. Your, your compliments don't count because you're my mom. You have to say it. If not, God will strike you with a lightning bolt and you'll die. You have to say that I'm handsome. What that means is that we've taken it for granted because of the proximity of, those, of that love. That love has always been there in some form, whether it's mother, grandmother, whomever. But that relationship has always been there, so thus we take it for granted. For some of us, I think that grace has been such a part of our lives, we tend to take it for granted. May we never take the grace of God for granted. But when we start to pray, when we start to understand, when we start to ask the question and make the statement, I need your grace, then we declare this over our lives and we are confessing the following things. Number one, we are confessing, I'm imperfect and I failed. Listen, for some of us, that's freedom right now. Listen, we just need to know, be free from the burden of being perfect. Because I know some of y'all in here have been living with that for a long time. Husbands, don't, don't elbow your wives. Please, you're going to get in trouble. But we need to be freed from the idea that I'm perfect. We failed. We've messed up. And we also confess that we need grace and that grace is outside of ourselves. We do not generate grace within ourselves, but that grace must come from God. And that we also confess that we are remorseful and repentant. That's a word that we don't like to hear a whole lot anymore, repentance. Repentance means is an intentional shift in our direction, a spiritual 180. See, we all want to talk about grace, but we don't want to talk about remorse. We want to be filled with grace, but we don't want to be filled with repentance. And what that really means is we have, we have people that fill church seats and pews every Sunday that want to simply be made, made to feel better about the mistakes that they've made. I don't want to confront the mistakes I've made. I just want to wash it over and feel good that there's grace for me. There is grace for you and there's grace for me, but that begins with repentance. It begins with the understanding that I've messed up. See, we don't want to admit that we've messed up. We want to live in a world with 100% um, resourcing and 0% accountability. Right? That's how I was as a teenager. Dad, if you could just give me 100% resourcing and 0% accountability, everything would be great. I want a car. I want keys. I want gas. I want insurance. But don't, please, don't make me come home at a curfew. Right? Grace begins with repentance. Repentance. And repentance is something we should not feel guilty about. There's no condemnation. But the repentance is that churning. It is that stick in our hearts. It is that, that red flag that goes off that says, hey, we need to make a change. And that change comes from outside of ourselves. You need help. I need help. And when we pray that, when we say, forgive us our sins, we're saying, I need your grace, God. I need your grace. I'm imperfect. I've messed up. And that grace comes outside for myself. Now, let's put this into action. When I confess my need for grace, I create room for his Holy Spirit to work. When we make that confession, when we unlock this in our lives, we actually open our hearts and we open the door to our hearts like it says in Revelation chapter 3, and the Holy Spirit can now work and do something in our lives. It's like when you open the, the difference is when you open the garage door and you see just the mess, the pile of stuff everywhere, and one person's going, oh, this is a mess, we need to clean it up. It's different than when you open the garage door and go, there's no mess. I can't even step foot into the garage. No, it's fine. When we admit that we need grace, when we pray this, 
on a daily basis. We are opening up and creating room for the Holy Spirit to work in our lives and to make us better. And that's what this is all about, being on a journey to grow closer with Him and to grow in, in the truth that He gives us and to grow in the power of His presence. But we can't do that if we are oblivious to the fact that we need help. That's what grace does. Number five, I'm going to have to go quickly. As we forgive everyone indebted to us, what this means, boiled down, is help me to give the grace I've received. And this is where it gets real for most of us. This is where it gets tough. Grace is best when it flows, not best when it's stockpiled. Luke 11 says, everyone indebted to us. Ouch, that's tough. Because we have grace for the people we like. We have grace for the situations that are okay for us. We have grace for certain mistakes, but not others. But it says everyone. Everyone. And you've never been tested on that until you, God leads you to forgive somebody who's hurt you so bad that the very mention of their name is loathsome to you. Has anybody ever been there? That's a tough one. God says, I'm calling you to forgive this. Uh, nope. Not yet. Give me six months, Lord. Right? And you kind of have that Yosemite Sam moment. Every time you hear their name, somebody says their name and you're like, rah, 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 rabbit, you know. You don't even realize you're doing it. That's where it gets tough. So we have grace for the people we like. Or we have grace for the people that we think are deserving of our grace. But God says that we need to give grace. Grace is flow through. And so what happens, we put this into practice. When we give the grace that God gives us, we actually become a conduit for his Holy Spirit to flow through at a greater level. So we talk about, God, flow through me. Use me. God, I want to advance your kingdom. God, grow me. I want to make a difference. I want to make an impact. And so often we think about what that means is like powerful conversations or doing this or doing these great things. No, 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 no. Listen, at its base core, it's giving the grace that God has given us. Listen, God will not trust you to be the conduit for his miracles until he can trust you to be the conduit for the grace to flow through. When I forgive, I steward God's most precious gift, his grace. And the last one, quickly, lead us not to temptation. Lead us not into temptation. And what that means is when you boil it down is I will follow you as you chart my course. I will follow you as you chart my course. Imagine every day praying that and making that an emphasis. God, I just want to follow you. I just want to be close to you. And I'm going to let you chart my course. I'm going to let you chart it. Have you ever been so lost? You know, you put in the GPS and you know you're lost and you're like, you know what? I don't care what, GP, what Google or Siri tells me. I'm following it. Has anybody ever been there? You're driving and you're like, I'm just going to plug it in. If it takes me to Timbuktu and then all the way back, that's all right. Because I'm just, I don't want to have the burden of knowing where I'm going. I'm just going to completely trust my phone or my GPS system. That's what this prayer does and unlocks for our lives. It frees us from unnecessary worry. It frees us from the burden of having to have all the answers. We can just say, you know what, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what the answers are, but I'm just going to get close to him. I'm going to follow him because he has the answers. I'm just going to get close to him. My three-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Kaylee, um, is, has not become aware of her surroundings in parking lots just yet. She's still at that age to where you get her down and immediately you're like, stay close to me, stay close to me. Because she just wants to run out. Ah, if, she, if she sees a pedal all the way across the parking lot, she's going to run. And, and no matter what. And the thing is, as a father, I just have to keep her. She just has to stay close to me and hold my hand. I will chart the course. I will keep her 
from getting run over by a car. That is my burden as a father, to chart the course through the parking lot and to keep her out of harm's way. And I know every father has probably done this. Have you ever done where you're, you're walking like on this side and you see like movement over here of a car and you step over and you get in the way? And the thought is if, if that guy is an idiot and just hits the gas pedal and backs up like an idiot, he's at least just gonna hit me. And I would much rather he hit me than hit my daughter. See, that's what God does in our lives. When we stay close to him, he charts our course and he gets in between us and potential danger. When he stays close to us, he says, you know what, I'm going to chart your path. And if something looks dangerous on the horizon, if something looks like it's about to run you over, I'm going to get right here because he's got to come through me to get to you. When we pray this in our lives, lead me not into temptation. We're praying, God, chart my course. I want to stay close to you because I know you will not lead me into temptation because you are good. I just want to stay close to you. And it frees us. It frees us. When I let God lead, I am free from unnecessary worry. So let's put this all together. All these statements. I took these statements and I kind of put them all together again and kind of a reworded the Lord's Prayer. And this is, this is kind of my prayer and how it rings in my life. And I encourage you to take the Lord's Prayer and to really boil it down in it, how it applies to your life. And this is what I, when I put it all together in my life, this is what it is and this is what it means. Loving and intimate God, you are worthy of my praise no matter what. Help me to want the things you want as I trust you to provide what I need. And I know I need your grace. So help me to give it as I receive it. And I will follow you as you chart my course. I'm telling you, if you take this prayer, a prayer that we so often get, gets overlooked because we've heard it so many times, but really think about what these, each statement means. They serve as a blueprint. They serve as power statements that will unlock your prayer life. No matter what you are stuck on, no matter what situation is going on in your life, these statements, this prayer can unlock your prayer life and take your prayer life to a whole other level.